it this morning, okay, um, just because it suits the theme. Uh, so I'm going to preach now, that's going to lead us into communion, but hopefully that will also uh, give us a little time to respond. Um, we tend to live very full lives. Often there's not much space, and I hope towards the end of the service we can create a bit of space just to allow us to encounter and respond to God. Okay, we got the PowerPoint up? It is, it's all right, that, I can't see the screen, that's okay, right. How often have you said, I told you so? Anybody ever said that? <laughs> Anybody ever thought that? Because <laughs> actually we don't always say it, but often we think that. I wonder how you felt when you said that. Smug? Self-satisfied? Now, actually, often we just feel disappointed, don't we? Because we think, oh, if, if only he'd listened. If only he'd listened. This wouldn't have happened like that. For over 40 years, the prophet Jeremiah has been seeing, saying the same thing. In a whole variety of different ways, through the reign of five different kings, the same message. Change your ways or disaster will overcome you. And Jeremiah's message is ignored. Sometimes people just don't listen to him, and on other occasions his message is resisted physically, and there are consequences for Jeremiah. But finally, as we shall see this morning, finally what Jeremiah has been prophesying for 40 years through the reign of five different kings actually happens. And when it happens... Jeremiah stands in the middle of Jerusalem and says, I told you so. No, he doesn't. He never says that. He may have thought it, but actually Jeremiah's heart breaks as he sees the destruction of all that he had loved and cared about. Let's read the account of that in Jeremiah chapter 39. And uh, we're going to make our way in a fairly leisurely fashion through most of chapter 39 and the beginning of chapter 40, but we're just going to read the first 10 verses to start with of Jeremiah 39. This is how Jerusalem was taken. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Jerusalem with his whole army and laid siege to it. And then on the ninth day of the fourth month of Zedekiah's eleventh year, the city wall was broken through. It was an 18-month siege uh, from December 588 BC through to about June or July 586 BC. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came and took seats in the middle gate. Nergal, Nergal Sharazar of Samgar, Nebo Sazkim, a chief officer, Nergal Shazarar, a high official, and all the other officials of the king of Babylon. When Zedekiah, king of Judah, and all the soldiers saw them, they fled. They left the city at night by way of the king's garden, through the gate between the two walls, and headed towards the Arabah, that's the Jordan Valley. But the Babylonian army pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. They captured him and took him to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, at Riblah in the land of Hamath where he pronounced sentence on him. Then at Riblah, the king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and also killed all the nobles of Judah. Then he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with bronze shackles to take him to Babylon. The Babylonians set fire to the royal palace and the houses of the people and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Nebuzaradan, commander of the imperial guard, carried into exile to Babylon the people who remained in the city, along with those who had gone over to him and the rest of the people. But Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guard, left behind in the land of Judah some of the poor people who owned nothing. And at that time he gave them vineyards and fields. We'll just pause there, because the first thing to note this morning is that the word of the Lord is always fulfilled. What God says is true, and therefore what God says always comes true, because it's trustworthy and reliable. And uh, 
Starting from Monday, many of us will be engaging in the You've Got, Ta You've Got the Time initiative. And as we begin to listen, or some of us read those passages, as we begin to hear God's word, then we will hear promises, and we will hear instructions about how to live well. And it's all true. What we'll be doing during that period is we will be putting on God's glasses. We will be seeing the world through a completely different lens, if you like. We will be seeing things from God's perspective. And what we will find is that it is an encouragement and a challenge. Because the encouragement is that, yeah, we've been building our lives on some of this stuff. And the encouragement is to persist. But there will also be a challenge because there will be other things that we hear that we have to respond to. And in those moments, we find out whether we really believe God's word, don't we? Because if we really believe it, we'll put it into practice. If it's just something we're observing from afar, then it's just, well, it's like they said of Ezekiel. They said to Ezekiel, oh, come and prophesy because you're like somebody singing lovely songs. They never did it. They just liked hearing the words. One of the things we learn from this passage is that often for God to fulfill his will, it takes time, which we find difficult to grasp in an age of instant everything. I wonder what doubts Jeremiah had. I mean, for 40 years, five kings, he's been saying the same thing. And for much of this period, the nation felt secure. It seemed as though everything was all right and everything would continue as it had been forever. And yet throughout this period, Jeremiah, he keeps predicting, if you don't change your ways, disaster is coming. And sometimes it looked like it was going to happen. And other times it looked like it would never happen. I mean, he started during the reign of Josiah, who was a good king. For much of his period, uh, Judah was a very affluent place to live. And yet Jeremiah persists. And in fact, in chapter 37, a little bit before this, the Babylonians turn up outside Jerusalem. And Jeremiah must have thought, this is it. And then Pharaoh hears about it, and Pharaoh marches north. Nebuchadnezzar, the, the Babylonian emperor, hears about it, and the Babylonians melt away. I bet Jeremiah took some stick then, didn't he? Oh, yes, Jeremiah. Because I bet when they turned up, Jeremiah, you know, there was a bit of, well, I told you so. And then they melt away. And yet Jeremiah persists. This is what God has said, and this is what will happen. You see, God always keeps his word. But are we banking on that? Or have you actually got a bit of a plan B? Are you banking on God's word being true, or are you hedging your bets? Are you committed to that, as uh, Eugene Peterson puts it, that long obedience in the same direction, that persistent following of God and his purposes? Because often in the Bible, as we find it here, God takes his time over fulfilling his word. Very rarely does it happen instantly. It does sometimes, but often it takes time. And in this circumstance, it takes time because God is full of mercy. And he does not want to bring judgment on his people. He's longing for them to respond so that actually he can show them mercy. And so it takes time. And yet they will not respond. And yet there is another reason why God often takes his time. And as I read scripture and as I reflect on my own experience, it's often that God does want to do it. He is willing, but we're not ready. It's not that we're not ready to be obedient, but it's actually there is not yet enough maturity about us to handle what God wants to do in and through us. You see, however magnificent the building, if the foundation is not good enough, it won't stand, will it? And what happens is when the building falls, the foundations are destroyed as well. And sometimes in our lives, God is waiting for us to be ready for that maturity in us, that actually we can handle what God wants to do. Otherwise, we will not stand. It will crush us because we're not ready to handle it. I remember many years ago, and you'll find out it was a few years ago as the story unfolds, 
I was sitting reflecting with God about some of the things he'd promised me. And uh, I was looking forward to what God was going to do. And he reminded me of an incident that happened the day before. Our boys were very small at the time and we'd taken them out to a park and they'd gone on the crazy golf and they'd loved it. And next to it was a proper putting green. And because at the time I played a lot of golf, I was very keen for my boys to play golf. And so I took them onto the putting green and it was a disaster because <laughs> they weren't ready. They didn't understand it. And actually, they didn't have the kind of coordination. I mean, it was a pretty slick putting green. It wasn't one of those really rough ones. And of course, as soon as they tapped the ball, it went further beyond the hole than where they'd started from. And they got frustrated. And it was as if God said to me, you know, those things I will do on your life, in your life when you are ready. If you have them now to be like your boys on the putting green, you will be frustrated. You won't understand it. You need to be more mature. And sometimes in our lives, God is ready, but he's waiting for that maturity in our lives. And Jeremiah goes on, living with unfulfilled promises as well. You see, Jeremiah, he prophesies why God is bringing disaster. Yes, it's judgment, but it's judgment actually in order to restore the people. And there will come a time when the exiles come back. There will come a time when God blesses his people. But Jeremiah never sees that in his lifetime. It reminds me of Hebrews 11:39 in that great passage about faith. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. I mean, he's talking specifically about Jesus, but they never received it in fullness. So what happened to Jeremiah? Well, I've mentioned it before. If you're in a city that is besieged, when the siege is over and the invading army breaks through, history tells us that that army, well, they wreak a terrible revenge on the inhabitants of the city. And, uh, you know, it's horrible. <coughs> Jeremiah is kept safe, as we shall see. Let's read on from uh, Jeremiah 39, uh, verse 11. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had given these orders about Jeremiah through Nebuzaradan, commander of the imperial guard. Take him and look after him. Don't harm him, but do for him whatever he asks. I mean, that's extraordinary, isn't it? How did Nebuchadnezzar, this evil despot, know about Jeremiah? We don't know. But he gives specific orders to protect Jeremiah. Verse 13, so Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guard, Nebush Azban, there we go, I nearly got it out, a chief officer, Nogel Shazar, a high official, and all the other officers, who thankfully are not named, of the king of Babylon, sent and had Jeremiah taken out of the courtyard of the guard. They handed him over to Gedaliah, son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, to take him back to his home. So he remained among his own people. While Jeremiah had been confined in the courtyard of the guard, the word of the Lord came to him, go and tell Ebed-Melech, the Cushite, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, I am about to fulfill my words against this city through disaster, not prosperity. At that time they will be fulfilled before your eyes. But I will rescue on that day, declares the Lord. You will not be handed over to those you fear. I will save you. You will not fall, fall by the sword but will escape with your life because you trust in me, declares the Lord. There was a kind of love-hate relationship between Jeremiah and the king Zedekiah, and uh, Jeremiah's life was under great threat. He was likely to be killed. And Ebed-Melech, the Cushite, he was an Ethiopian eunuch. If you don't know the story of the Ethiopian eunuch in the New Testament, you will hear that as we go through You've Got the Time. It's interesting, there's one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. But this Ethiopian eunuch had interceded on behalf to the king, on behalf of Jeremiah. He had preserved his life. He had been used to take care of him. And actually what had happened to Jeremiah was that during the siege, he was kind of under arrest. But actually he was under arrest, kept in the courtyard of the guard, which meant he was fed and he was safe. And uh, when the siege falls, Jeremiah is in the safest place of all. And this Cushite, this Ethiopian, who goes out on a limb for Jeremiah, the word of the Lord to him is, 
your life will be preserved as well. I will honour you because you honoured me. You see, God is no man's debtor. God is no woman's debtor. God is no child's debtor. God honours those who honour him. Now, we have to be honest, it isn't always true that people's lives are preserved as these two were. I mean, William Carey, the father of modern missions, uh, once that kind of initiative got going, uh, thousands and thousands of folk left these shores uh, to follow God's call in missionary work. And many families went, and their ships arrived, and they, they arrived in India and the West Indies and Africa, and whole families died at the coast. They never got inland because they died from malaria or typhoid or whatever the local illness was. This is the grave of a man who went to uh, Africa. But God honours those who honour him. And God does preserve our lives, maybe not our physical lives, but our eternal lives. God is no man or woman's debtor. So what happens to Jeremiah? Let's read on, verse uh, chapter 40. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Nebuzaradan, commander of the imperial guard, had released him at Ramah. He had found Jeremiah bound in chains among all the captives from Jerusalem and Judah who were being carried into exile to Babylon. When the commander of the guard found Jeremiah, he said to him, the Lord your God decreed this disaster for this place. And now the Lord has brought it about. He's done just as he said he would. All this happened because you people sinned against the Lord and did not obey him. But today I am freeing you from the chains on your wrists. Come with me to Babylon, if you like, and I'll look after you. But if you don't want to, then don't come. Look, the whole country lies before you. Go wherever you please. However, before Jeremiah turned to go, Nebuzaradan added, Go back to Gedaliah son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon has appointed over the towns of Judah, and live with him among, your, among the people, or go anywhere else you please. Then the commander gave him provisions and a present and let him go. Come and retire to Babylon. How attractive that must have seemed. You looking forward to retirement? Maybe most of you are. And Jeremiah, I mean, he's given a choice. You can come back to Babylon, you can go wherever you like. And he could have justified going to Babylon, couldn't he? You know, he's already had a word for them, he's already written to them, there are already contacts, that famous promise that we often quote, you know, uh, I know the plans I have for you, etc., 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 is in that letter that was written to the exiles. God is calling me to go and minister in Babylon. It was an important role. I mean, these people in Babylon, they're the ones who are going to come back and they're the ones who are going to re-establish the nation. Surely, Jeremiah, it's important you go to Babylon and you sow into their lives so that when they come back, things will work well. Humanly speaking, it would have been a more significant ministry. But what Jeremiah chooses to do at the word of the Lord is stick with the people who are left behind. These broken dispirited, disheartened people. People also from a certain section of society, the poorest of the land, the most disadvantaged. I don't suppose Jeremiah was a particularly popular figure either. It might have been easier to slip off to Babylon and yet he follows God's word and sticks with these people, which just causes me to ask some questions about my own life. You know, who, who is God calling us to give our time to? Maybe for you it's a different issue. Who is God calling you to persist with? Jeremiah does not give up on the people that God has called him to be with. What if it's people you wouldn't initially choose to be with? Jeremiah came from the priestly caste. Actually, he didn't have a lot in common with the poor of the land. And yet these are the people that God calls him to be with. And it gets worse, because Gedaliah, who's now the new governor of this province, appointed by Nebuchadnezzar, he is assassinated by hot-headed idiots from within the Jewish community. 
they realise that Nebuchadnezzar will return and exact a terrible revenge. They're going to flee to Egypt, and on the way they stop off with Jeremiah, and they say to Jeremiah, have you got a word from God for us? Blooming cheek. Having the cheek of it. And so Jeremiah says, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll intercede for you, and I'll see you in it. And God keeps them waiting ten days. Ten days later, Jeremiah has a word, and it's an extraordinary word. It's in chapter 42, verse 10. Listen to this. The word of the Lord is this, and it is completely kind of counterintuitive. The word of the Lord is, if you stay in this land, I will build you up and not tear you down. I will plant you and not uproot you, for I am grieved over the disaster I've inflicted on you. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you now fear. Do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord. For I am with you and will save you and deliver you from his hand. What a wonderful word. You know, this is a prophet with a good track record. So what do they say to him? Chapter 43, chapter 43 verse 2. It says this, you are lying. The Lord our God has not sent you to say, you must not go to Egypt to settle there. I wonder how you respond when God says what you don't want to hear. Because one of the things I observe some Christians doing is they then go around until they find somebody who tells them what they want to hear. And maybe we're all a bit guilty of that. But these people do not want to hear what God has to say to them. And they go to Egypt. wait for James to make his way around the lap. So they go to Egypt. It's not up there, it's over here. They go to Egypt, and guess what? Jeremiah goes with them. Jeremiah goes with them. He keeps speaking to them. He speaks to them about idolatry. And they won't listen. They will not listen. From Jeremiah chapter 46, there are a series of prophecies about the other nations. We don't actually know about the end of Jeremiah's life. Hebrews 11, speaking of Moses, reminds me also of Jeremiah. He chose to be ill-treated with the people of God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He could have gone to Babylon and enjoyed a quiet retirement, but he sticks with God's calling in his life. Those missionaries who laid down their lives they stuck with what God had called them to do. And I think as we look at this remarkable character of who Jeremiah is, we have to ask the question, how did he do it? How did he manage to live like this? Because as we as a church continue, as Roy was reminding us last week, as we continue to uh, journey uh, towards being a missional or missionary church, then it's people like Jeremiah that we need to learn from, from their example. Because it's going to be a bumpy ride at times, just as it was for Jeremiah. The first thing I think to pick out is this, that, that Jeremiah's life was built on God's word. Do you remember that quotation Roy came out with last week? It's not that the church has a mission, but that the God of mission has a church. You got that? And we need to rediscover the ways of our missionary God. We need to read the Bible as a missionary text, understanding the heart of God. We need to build on God's word, taking that long-term view. Uh, most social commentators, and I think the evidence is all there, is that we are living through one of those great tipping points in history. And like Jeremiah, some of the things that he longed to see, he didn't see. He longed to see the nation restored. He didn't see it. There will be things that we invest in. We will not see the fruit of that in our generation. But if we invest wisely, then we will see that in future generations from glory. You see, as I read Jeremiah's life, I see that he is content to live his place in a bigger story, in God's story. It's not all about Jeremiah and his ministry. 
It's about Jeremiah's place in God's story. And he continues the work of those who came before him, Isaiah and the others. And he prepares the way for those who come after him. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. He sticks with his call. A few weeks ago, we looked at uh, Jeremiah's moaning, groaning, all that business. The frustration he had with God. <clears throat> but because he faces that frustration with God, he is able to work his way through it. And in Jeremiah, we see a lot of Jesus because ultimately what it comes down to is character. It comes down to character. Jeremiah was not some superhuman figure. We've read the outpourings of his heart. He was very, very human. But he persisted and he finished the race. Quite how he finished the race, we don't know. He kind of drifts off into obscurity. Living with a rebellious people who are living the wrong way in the wrong place. And yet Jeremiah sticks with them because that is where God wants him to be. There are no shortcuts to character formation. I wish there were. Wouldn't it be great if you could download an app? Christian character. Zoom. But actually Christian character is often established, the Bible tells us, through perseverance. Through perseverance. The Apostle James, he knew a thing or two about it. The brother of Jesus writes this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So I just encourage those of you this morning who are in hard places and difficult times, persist. Persist. Because what does it say? Persistence finishes its work so that you may be mature and not lacking anything anything. There's an awful lot of Jesus about Jeremiah. Have you seen that? There's an awful lot of Jesus about Jeremiah. And as we begin to approach the table, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's sing together. You chose the cross. <laughs>